If you're interested in heritage style boots, despite the quality and history of English boots from Northampton in particular, your interest probably centers more in the American styles. I'll explain why I think so in a minute, but that being the case, I think we should talk about some American heritage brands and boots. Stay with me and let's take a quick look at some American classics. G'day, welcome to Bootlosophy. If you're new to my channel, my name is Tech. And if you like what you see, don't forget to click on the like and subscribe. I come to you from Wajuk country in Perth in Western Australia, and I acknowledge the Wajuk people as the traditional custodians of these lands and seas. Today, I'm going to compare some American historic heritage brands represented by their most iconic models. The Red Wing Iron Ranger, the Chippewa Service Boot, the Wolverine uh, Thousand Mile Boot, the Alden Indy, and the Allen Edmonds Higgins Mill. I'll try to identify their common DNA and show you their differences, like uh, finding some long lost cousins who have grown up different but came from the same origins. Now, I did mention the Heritage Northampton tradition of bootmaking in the introduction. If you're looking at Heritage style, quality made, good you welted and stitched down styles, uh, you can't ignore the likes of Crockett and Jones, Joseph Cheney and Sons, Lokes, Churches, Edward Green, John Lobb, just to name a few. And yet, as someone who has found an interest in heritage boots, you would be in the large majority if you admit to knowing much more about American brands. Now, personally, I, I think there are two reasons. The first is that in the mid-2000s, Asian youth, particularly in Japan, picked up the American heritage clothing trend, including Americana mid-20th century boots. Inevitably, I think, um, this trend bounced back to the US, raising awareness there that all of these great brands that once existed have been on the decline, uh, having been closed or have been bought out by hedge funds. The Gordon Geckos took over troubled cash cows and trimmed them down to basic financial fundamentals and in so many ways not only lost their American manufacturing base but also lost their souls. So that American heritage trend that first arose in Asia went back to the US and because it still is the largest buying economy in the world, has also fed the rest of the world's interest. The second reason I think that English brands haven't surfed the trending waves is that they are, uh, and I do not mean this condescendingly, they are slower to move. They are steeped in history. They have deep familial traditions, believe in doing things the old way. And this has meant that they have been slower to react, except for maybe those few that have been taken over by their younger generations. We can have a straw poll. Those of you who are watching, leave a comment below about what historic brands of boots interest you, American or rest of the world. Let me know. At any rate, here we are. And to compare some iconic American makes and models, I've picked these classic models out of my collection. I have here Red Wing's iconic cap toe boot, the Iron Ranger. Then uh, the now discontinued Chippewa service boot, Although I notice in social media, uh, Chippewa seems to be active again with a self-titled Chippewa OG account. Next is Wolverine's Thousand Mile Boot. Classic elegance, uh, especially in this Chrome Excel version. The Alden Indiana Jones boot is next, except this is a 403 model in brown Chrome Excel, and the real boot of the movies is the 405 in a kind of reddish brown calf leather. And then finally, I'm adding to this list the Allen Edmonds Higgins Mill. It's an old brand, but not really an old classic boot. It's a service boot that's regenerated from old bones during the service boot trend that emerged uh, in the 2010s. Why have I chosen these models? Well, first, they come from American brands running back into history. The oldest brand in this selection is Alden, uh, founded by Charles Alden in 1884 in Massachusetts on the east coast of the US. 
This model, the 403 fake mock toe, uh, original work boot, came about in the 1950s. Uh, the second, by a close margin, is Wolverine. Depending on if you count the founding of a tannery or the actual production of footwear, the Wolverine Company started in 1883 in Michigan, uh, near the Great Lakes, but production of footwear came a bit later. Uh, this Wolverine 1000 mile boot was originally introduced in 1914 as a durable work boot. Chipper was next oldest, in, uh, uh, founded in 1901. Chippewa started uh, production of footwear in Chippewa Falls in Wisconsin. Chippewa has always produced a work boot like this, except this particular model called the Classic 6-inch Service Boot came out in the 2000s, but it was based on earlier unnamed work boots made by Chippewa before the First World War. Then came Red Wing in 1905, founded by Charles Beckman in Red Wing, Minnesota. Again, starting as work boots, the blacksmith and then this Iron Ranger model emerged in the 1930s. This Iron Ranger style is probably the boot that kicked off the Americana trend in Japan in the 2000s. But there is a heritage twist, and I'll tell you about that later. Allen Edmonds is the youngest company, founded in 1922 by Albert Allen in Belgium, Wisconsin, later joined by partner Bill Edmonds. This Higgins Mill boot isn't actually a heritage boot, but rather a heritage style boot first appearing in the 2010s as a response to the service boot regeneration started by Weiberg, but based on uh, military boots that they did make in the 1940s. So these grand brands started at varying times around the turn of the 20th century all across the US, producing these classics at even more varying times. But they do have a common DNA. A lot of that DNA is based on the typical shoe fashion of the 20th century. Now, those of you my age will remember what your fathers wore up to the 50s and 60s. Straightforward, smooth leather, black or brown shoes. <laughs> Whether shoes for the office or boots for some digging in the garden, there were no commando soles or rough out uppers or rambler or waxy commander. Just smooth grain, black, brown or tan leather, and probably on leather soles or at least thin rubber soles. So you can't get away from the older models of this bunch, and those that followed like the Alden and the Higgins Mill all started model life with smooth grain leather and probably Chrome Excel, which itself was first tanned by Horween in 1913. Even this Chippewa service boot was originally available in Chrome Excel as the main choice. This crazy horse leather didn't appear until the 2010s. The other commonality is that, apart from the uh, Alden mock toe, they're all similar in design. Originally designed as service boots or work boots, what's the difference really? They are about uh, six inches high in the shaft, uh, low block heel, uh, either cap toe or plain toe, quite rounded and with some toe bump, and they're all Goodyear welted. They generally have flat soles, better for working in at the time before the technology of commando lug soles uh, started appearing in the 1930s. One last common history was the war effort. All of these brands made boots for the troops in the First World War, but also in the Second World War where production effort was really unequal due to the high numbers of servicemen and women involved in that war. Apparently, as many brands made boots for soldiers, the soldiers started to compare brands, swapping them, uh, preferring obviously those models made to last and those that were sturdier. So at the end of the war, uh, returning servicemen needing civilian boots and shoes stayed loyal to the brands that they preferred during the war and helped brands like these become popular and successful. I remember my own father talking about his William Lennon British Army boots. Uh, he said that it was the only brand that didn't fall apart in the wet tropical jungles during his service against the Japanese in the war. Clearly, servicemen had long memories about what served them well. Let's take a look at each of these boots because they did drift apart as more modern marketing and manufacturing made different calls on the brands uh, and the design and models. I'm going to start with this uh, Alden 403 Indie boot. You can watch my full review up there. Now, uh, you all know that this is called the Indie because of Harrison Ford wearing them in the Indiana Jones movies. Before that, it was simply called the 
that model, the Model 405 work boot. Now before you scoff at these being work boots, think back, if you're old enough, back to the 1970s. Work boots were not technical. They were simply smooth grain leather boots uh, that were sturdy, and if you needed toe protection, you got something like the Iron Ranger with the cap toe. If you were in a, say, lighter trade like carpentry, you got maybe a thousand mile boot or the Alden 405. Now this is the Alden 403 or the Chrome Excel model built on the True Balance Last. The difference in this boot uh, from the others is uh, the toe profile. Unlike the other older boots, it has a lower profile toe box, which is why many today will scoff at the idea that you wore these to do manual labor. The mock toe stitching is merely cosmetic, but obviously adds to the different look. The construction is a 270 degree Goodyear welt, which is, gives a, a sleeker look when you look up the heel. As for how they're built, if you've been watching boot review videos, you've seen the famous Rose Anvil video. They use leatherboard in many places instead of real leather, and Rose Anvil berates them for doing this and charging the premium price of 600 US dollars. In their perhaps weak defense, Alden do say that leatherboard does have redeeming properties to do specific jobs within their boots, such as better moisture wicking. But at any rate, one of their chief pros is the way the Alden Indies provide superb arch support and comfort, probably unequaled even amongst my PNW boots. This comes from Alden's orthopedic shoe manufacturing heritage. The design of this boot built support in the arch as the foundation of the design. The inside isn't unusual, but due to the way the last is narrow in the arch and curves the uppers at that point, like a cantilevered support, and due to the shape of the True Balance last and the use of the Thomas heel, uh, as well as a shank, all adds up to superb arch support. Many people would pay over the price of materials for that comfort, especially if you were to wear it as a work boot or a boot to stand in all day. As befits their users today, as in not a work boot, it is fully leather lined, where once I believe it had a canvas half lining. Another point of difference is the continued use of the smooth neoprene cork sole. Uh, while many other manufacturers have moved from this cork infused rubber sole, Alden have persevered and honestly it's comfortable and a, and a lot more grippy than you would expect. Next, uh, let's take a look at the Allen Edmonds Higgins Mill. Again, I'll put a card up there for the full review. Okay, this is not a historic boot because it only came out as a service boot response to the service boot trend relatively recently. But it has a lot of Ellen Edmonds' history in it as a maker of military service boots. This has been modernized up uh, by making the toe box sleeker and lower profile than a normal military boot of that age with a bump toe. So you would wear this boot neat casual, even with a suit, and I think you would not wear this as a rough and tough service or work boot, even digging in the garden, despite the tough chrome excel. Uh, the points of difference? Some typical Allen Edmonds decorative styling, such as the swoop stitch in the quarters. There's no structural reason to have it there, it just looks good and different. It is fully leather lined uh, for comfort, as befits a, a boot coming from Allen Edmonds' more refined offerings, giving more uh, finished look and feel to the boot. The Chrome XL used is not particularly well chosen. The clicking seems arbitrary, as you can see in the quarters here, show increasing and some loose grain. It is 360 degree Goodyear welted, and so, unlike the Alden Indy, it has a ledge protruding at the back above the heel. Uh, the welt is a split reverse welt, so it provides a little more water resistance at the joint of sole and uppers. Inside, there is a cork filling, and sometimes with a shank, sometimes not. I hear different reports from different cobblers and others on Instagram and uh, YouTube. Someone actually told me that they contacted Ellen Edmonds who told them that since the heel is low, they didn't feel the need to insert a shank. And yet I've seen teardowns where there obviously was a shank. It's possible that shank or shankless may depend on when a particular boot was made and what design or structural or dare I say it, cost-cutting activity was happening at that time. I've seen discussion that some shanks pulled out were steel, and yet some said they were fiberglass. <laughs> A real mishmash. 
and we're shank or shankless, uh, this one is not uncomfortable. The arch support is not particularly good or bad. The last is not especially good or bad, but it is stylish, as you would expect from the company that makes the very stylish Brogue Dalton boot. Sizing is the usual half down from Brannock's size, and the fit is okay, nothing special. Comfortable enough, but again, nothing special. The outsole is the ubiquitous rubber day night another turn-of-the-century invention coming from England, designed to provide grip while also providing a low-profile outsole that could replace dressy leather outsoles. Uh, in my opinion, the uh, a comfortable outsole uh, day night is, but there are others who disagree because of the initial feeling of the lumps that's caused by the studs. Moving on now to the uh, older models, here's the Chippewa service boot in crazy horse leather. Now, as I said, this has been around in some form or other since the 1930s, but this specific design of this boot came out in the late 40s, early 50s as a civilian work boot version of a service boot, and by the 2000s was called the 6-inch classic service boot. This service boot model is no longer made, but if you look at the Chippewa website, there is a heritage-style work boot that looks very similar. This was one of my first Goodyear welted service boots, and I really love this. It has a subtly rounded toe box uh, in the profile as well as from on top, so it's comfortable in the toe. And the last is nicely snug all around so that it grips but does not squeeze. The slight bump toe looks like what you'd expect a service boot to look like, and while you can or could get them in Chrome Excel and other smooth brown uh, black and burgundy leathers, I thought this crazy horse leather, which is a kind of oiled nubuck, was perfect for this design of service boot. It is very soft and supple and unlined in the shaft with a cotton uh, drill lining in the vent. There were some quality issues, um, see what they were in this full review here, but ultimately they didn't get worse. 360 degree Goodyear welted, cork filled and steel shanked, they are pretty comfortable even though a little hard in the insole uh, but fixed by an aftermarket foam insert. The outsole is Vibram's V-Bar sole, I think model number 700, which is firm but gives reasonable grip on dry surfaces and a little less grip on wet stuff. But it is low profile for casual wear and doesn't look like you're about to invade the Russian steppes. After Chippewa was sold to Warren Buffett's group, they substantially rationalised their range and basically ceased making their heritage line of boots and I think just about ceased production in the US. Uh, just as heritage style boots were coming back into fashion. So, not a good call there from the soulless bean counters. As I said earlier from their social media, I think they're trying to make a heritage style comeback. Um, as a plain toe boot, there are many similarities with plain toe boots of that era, like Red Wing's Blacksmith and Beckman boots, or like this one coming up, the Wolverine Thousand Mile. Taking a look at the Thousand Mile, uh, there is definitely a similar look in the bump toe profile and almost squared off side walls at the toe. My full review of this Wolverine Thousand Mile is up here. This is not a boot that I wear often, even though I do like the look of it. Originally designed as a work boot in 1914 with the design sensibilities of that time uh, looking like a dress boot, it's a bit of an anomaly today because in this Color 8 Chrome Excel and the 270 degree Goodyear welt, it does look dressy. But with the bump toe, it also looks work booty. <laughs> so I'm a bit confused as how to wear it today. I think our sensibilities today lean toward more of the Higgins Mill uh, lower profile toe box and dressier boots. To be honest, if you glanced at it quickly, you could mistake it for a pair of Red Wings 9011 Beckman boots showing how close all the designs were in that era. The 270 degree Goodyear welt, the uh, contrast triple stitching uh, on the quarter, all forgivable if you thought it was a Beckman. The differences are subtle. This one is uh, on an oil infused leather sole. I, I bought these from eBay with the rubber toppy sole protector already put on by the previous owner. I regret it. While it does protect the leather, it does also feel less flexible as it was originally intended to feel. The rubber protects the leather sole from moisture for sure, but I do know that the oil infused leather is also itself water resistant to a degree and is grippier and hardier 
than naked leather soles like, say, Grant Stone's leather soles. Unlike the Beckman, the hardware includes uh, speed hooks, which, based on original work boot intentions, makes it a lot easier to put on and take off. The feel of the fit is also subtly different. When the heel, uh, uh, although the heel measures about the same, it feels like a flatter boot, and that might be because the arch is somehow uh, sloped down to the ball in a way that's much more subtle. Inside is a leather insole and cork filler, uh, and there is a steel shank, all of which makes it uh, feel very comfortable underfoot. Sizing of this is a half down from your true Brannock size, and the fit in this last is very, very good, hugging the foot securely without squeezing the ball of the foot or the toes. Finally, we come to the granddaddy of the modern work boot service boot fashion trend. Now, I am well aware that many American uh, manual workers still wear these as work boots at work, but it is fair to say that many, many people who buy these do not. <laughs> This is the iconic Red Wing Iron Ranger in its most iconic makeup, amber harness leather. Watch my full review of an older pair up there. Uh, if you shut your eyes and drew a typical work or service boot, I reckon you would draw this. Bulbous cap toe, block heel, typical six inch height, nickel hardware. While the Iron Ranger first emerged in the 1930s, designed for the iron ore miners in the Masabi Iron Range, this is actually a modern version of that boot, rebuilt and redesigned by the Japanese designer Aki Iwasaki in, the two, in uh, 2005. Yes, because of the Bulbous cap toe, it does look different from the other classics, uh, but it maintains the same elements of their DNA. This amber harness leather, as well as all the other leather offerings on the Iron Ranger, are tanned by the in-house tannery SB Foot. While Chrome XL is also oil infused, the uh, amber harness leather is oil tanned. And you notice that when you touch this, feeling the oils inside the leather almost come off on your hands. The pull up is quickly apparent and the suppleness after breaking feels quite different from Chrome XL. Uh, like the uh, Thousand Mile, it is unlined in the shaft, uh, but unlike the Thousand Mile, the lining at the vamp is a cotton drill material rather than leather. It is certainly traditional and interesting that unlike Alden, they haven't taken the opportunity to upgrade the lining at this point in time. Uh, inside the boot is the traditional leather and cork in the insole, midsole and filler. And there is a triple ribbed steel shank underneath. Uh, built on the original Neo cork outsole, the combination makes it very comfortable as you break the boot in. But after a lot of hours in it, I do find that the edges of the insole start to feel apparent on my foot and I've had to put in a, a thin leather insert just to take that, that cut off. Today's Iron Rangers have a Vibram 430 mini lug sole providing some better grip, even though I've always felt that the Neo cork sole is grippy enough except on the slipperiest, iciest conditions. The finishing is not as clean as the other boots, uh, even the Chippewa, despite the uh, QC faults that I mentioned there. Red Wing is a big company making a lot of boots, and this is clearly, uh, although made by hand, it is clearly made in a mass production factory. Then again, that's why they're the cheapest of the US made boots at a US 350, while the 1000 mile are 400, the Higgins Mill nearly 500, and the Indies are 650. The Chippewa service boots are not made anymore, but there is a similar looking classic six inch boot on their website now selling for US 200, but not made in America. Now, as you know, I'm not a Made in USA fanatic, not being American. I'm not even a Made in Australia fanatic. As a management consultant, I believe quality comes from processes, not geography. But if you did go to Chippewa's website, I challenge you to easily find out where they're made. A brand that isn't proud of their factory is not exactly transparent. Now, as I end, I acknowledge there are other brands of classic American heritage boots that I haven't mentioned, uh, that I even have in my collection, like the Thoroughgood Classic 6-inch Mock Toe. Uh, I haven't mentioned White's, which is the oldest Pacific Northwest boot brand uh, from back to the American Civil War. And I do love my MPs. <laughs> um, I haven't mentioned brands like Danner's and Fry, uh, founded in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. Apart from Thoroughgood, uh, as a mock toe, and Whites, which to me as a PNW brand stands in a separate category anyway, 
The others haven't continued the early 20th century work boot or service boot DNA. Uh, they are the cousins who move too far away. Tell me if you agree. Let me know whether, like me, you focus on American heritage boots rather than the English, and why. But most of all, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> Looking at all of these, their star lives on in today's brands in Truman's, uh, Grant Stone, Parkhurst, Caswell, Thursday, you know, all the names. Uh, they live on in the work boot and service boot styles produced by makers like the Indonesian handmade makers. Service boot style? Will it live on forever? Stick with me and find out. Until the next time, take care and see you soon.